uh, where we're focusing on the client folks reforms and the KYP challenge. Uh, we had strong registrations today and a number of people are still logging in, but we do have a jam packed agenda, so we will uh, get started. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us uh, for today's, today's webinar. This is the third in our series uh, that we began back in September 2020, focusing on the KYP challenge. Over the course of these events, our conversations uh, have, have refined themselves as the rules have been updated, as dealers uh, are beginning to shift from asking questions about what the regulation is uh, to details about uh, implementation and planning uh, and moving forward. And it's a pleasure to be your hosts today. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Dave Carpreece and I'm the Vice President of Product and Marketing here at Investor.com. And while none of our guests are regulators, uh, so there's that disclaimer, we're always excited to welcome others uh, from the front lines to join us in providing insights and joining the conversation uh, as we uh, try to chart a path forward. And before we get started, I'd like to thank our panelists and ask them to provide a few brief words of, uh, of introduction. Uh, Richard, let's start with you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm, I'm Richard Roskies. I'm senior counsel at uh, AUM Law. It's, uh, I've basically been practicing in compliance and registrant regulation for about 10 years now. Although it seems like longer some days. Uh, I've, uh, basically my practice revolves around uh, helping firms with compliance audits, helping firms kind of stay on side of the regulatory expectations and uh, keeping in touch with uh, good, our good friends at the regulator. Excellent, Trevor. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, Trevor Frost. I'm a solution architect with uh, with IG Wealth Management for over uh, 10 years. With my my primary focus has been on uh, building out our, our dealer platform and supporting uh, various projects that are enhancing our, our wealth management products. Uh, for uh, for client focused reforms. Um, my role has been to assist the business and technical teams in designing the overall solution that we're implementing this year. I'm sure. Hi, I'm Greg Weeb. I'm the Associate Manager of Advisor Compliance Programs at Quadris Investment Services Limited, the mutual fund dealer for Canada Life. I've been with the company for since 1999. I've spent the last 14 years or so in compliance. During my career, I've worked closely with advisors, both training and auditing them. And I'm currently tasked with triaging and finding solutions for the KYC and suitability aspects of CFR. Thank you, and Param. Sorry for the lag, I'm trying to unmute myself. I don't know if, yeah, I am unmuted. Uh, Param Nasiri, nice to meet you all. Uh, VP of Regulatory Strategy at Investor.com. Before joining Investor.com, I spent over a decade at the OBSI and had some time spent at a management consultancy. Nice to meet you all. Wonderful. Thanks. Uh, thanks for introducing yourselves, and thank you for uh, taking time out of your schedule to uh, to join us for today's event. Uh, we do have a full forty five minute session planned for you today, uh, and we've split the time roughly in half between the dealer KYP obligations to assess, approve, and monitor products uh, made available to clients, and the second half uh, the advisor obligations. Uh, to understand products on their shelves and demonstrate that they've considered alternatives as part of making a recommendation. Uh, we will leave uh, about five minutes at the end for questions. The questions we will be submitted through the chat feature at the bottom or wherever you anchor the, the doc on your Zoom uh, window. So feel free to enter those questions during the course of the presentation. And, uh, and we will go through as many as we're able to at the end of the webinar. Now, without, uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll hand the mic over to Param uh, Nasseri to facilitate our conversation. Param, over to you. All right, thanks, Dave. So um, let me just make sure I've got... So reflecting on the road that started all the way back in the summer of 2018, we are certainly on the home stretch from a timing perspective. 
We know that both IROC and the MFDA have published their rule amendments. The conflicts related disclosure will need to be implemented on June 30th and all remaining aspects, including the KYP requirements will need to be implemented on December 31st. Through this journey, we've heard from a number of industry participants, including roundtables. So with 10 months remaining until the implementation deadline, we wanted to bring to together today's conversation with our practitioners and industry experts to help firms make key decisions with clarity and certainty. When uh, we polled the uh, 16 firms during our industry roundtable back in September, we learned that at that time, nearly 70% of our attendees were making great progress on their client focus reforms journey. Now, with only 10 months remaining until the implementation deadline, let me turn to our panelists. And Richard, I'll begin with you. What are your thoughts on how firms have generally responded to this journey and their state of readiness? Uh, it, it's interesting. I think it's every, or it should be on everyone's radar by now. Um, I, I would say probably about 60% of the clients I work with have kind of gone at least uh, knee deep into the, the conflict of interest requirements that are due in June. Uh, the KYP, KYC piece, I, I think most people have started to think about it, but they haven't kind of uh, weighted in with, uh, with kind of full focus yet. Def definitely not a, a huge topic on the implementation committee that I'm on. Um, and again, clients haven't really been thinking about it. Uh, but, but that being said, I, I guess kind of the messaging I would give to the people on this uh, webinar, um, depending on your product shelf, uh, specifically the KYP piece, uh, th there's a fair amount of work involved with it. So if, if you have a large product shelf, uh, now is probably the time that you should start thinking about it. Trevor, maybe I can point the question to you. Do you have any insights to share with our audience? Well, I think with, with KYP, we've been, uh, we've been working on this for, for quite some time, um, starting really in early, early uh, 2020, we were assessing this and understood uh, KYP to, you know, those requirements to be an extension of of what we already had around uh, monitoring uh, our product shelf for, for changes and, and ensuring suitability. Um, we're definitely, uh, I think within this month, looking to kind of finalize our solutions and, uh, and we're you know, obviously leveraging vendors to, to do this and, and select them and, and advance our, uh, our build with them. Greg, do you have any comments to share with our group? Yeah, uh, similar to Trevor, our legal and compliance team started breaking down the various components of CFR basically as soon as it came out. And uh, when they did, we assigned them to various tasks, various tasks and teams uh, early in summer. Uh, each of our team was tasked with triaging and assigning a section that was provided to them. And they're supposed to come up with a uh, solution uh, and a recommendation to the dealer, whether it's either technology based or otherwise. And right now we are in the uh, final decision-making stage with uh, InvestorCom regarding uh, the peer compare tool. And we will expect that it will assist with meeting our advisors and dealer compliance CFR obligations and are hopeful to go live in late, go live in late fall. Yeah. Thanks, Greg, that's really insightful. Now let's zoom in on the client focused reforms dealer specific KYP requirements as Richard and folks on the call have talked about today. What we know is that the client focus reforms have now codified what was previously regulatory guidance, requiring firms uh, to play a much more of a gatekeeping function on the products and securities they make available to their clients. Specifically, firms will now need to take reasonable steps to assess, approve, uh, and monitor significant changes on the securities they make available to their clients. So let me, with that said, let me shift to our panelists. What are your views on the general tone of conversation in the industry as it relates to the dealer-specific KYP requirements? Are there any areas around these requirements that are raising eyebrows in the industry? And did the comment letters and any of those responses you've seen so far introduce or raise any substantive items for us to discuss today? Richard, I'll, I'll respond to that first. Sure. Um, I mean, we just went through a round of comments for the MSDA and IROC rules. The, the comment period closed, uh, I believe it was January 18th. 
uh, wasn't a ton of comments. Uh, I think the letters were, were short but thoughtful. Um, but but I, I think the key to think about in terms of kind of where we are and where we're going is the last two years about has been about kind of baking the rules, baking the expectations, the principles. Uh, but but to use a really bad Super Bowl metaphor on uh, on Super Bowl week, if you want to call it that, is uh, they've taken us kind of to the to the last twenty yard line. Um, but the kind of interpretation of those rules, or the, again the, that important twenty yards to get to the, to, to the goal line, uh, how we interpret those rules are going to be really important. Um, and and if if there's one thing I'm going to sound like a broken record for this. Uh, for this webinar, it is that keep keep abreast of the uh, the implementation guidance and the FAQs that are coming out over the course of this year. Uh, interpretation of what's been uh, kind of already published is going to be key. Trevor, do you have any remarks on this front? Yeah, again, I'm coming at it from a, a technical uh, perspective. I'm not involved in some of the more detailed uh, review. But uh, you know what I'm hearing back from our business is, is we have a pretty good understanding, uh, at least at the higher higher level or the broader level, what we're looking to do. And and really, I think there's some conversation about the differences between MFDA and IROC. And uh, I think from our initial pass, we're looking at the similarities because we want to have as much as possible, you know, consistency of our, our practice. Um, but I think I think what is jumping out um, is the devil in the details when we get into IROC and the different types of securities uh, that are available to be held and and really the, how much, what's the cost benefit, what's the, the value to our client to, to dig into to some of these securities where we have a very small number of holdings for them and, and the cost could be high to, to be monitoring these, these products for changes. Um, and I think the other thing that's going to come out a bit, quite a bit is our, given that we have a high, uh, High volume of our assets are on our you know proprietary uh, um, product shelf. Um, is understanding the difference um, between how we would deal with our own products and how we uh, work with uh, our advisors uh, versus third-party products and, and securities. I think that's an area that we're going to look to uh, kind of be careful <laughs> with and, and refine as as we go forward. Thanks, Trevor. As you pointed out, uh, the devil's certainly in the details. And so let's sort of zoom in on that for a bit. Uh, can you discuss, uh, maybe Richard, I'll ask you to start with this question first, but can you discuss the, the requirements of assessing the products made available to clients? How does this requirement differ from dealers uh, who have proprietary products on their shelves? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's this This is where... Uh, I. I'll start by saying that if you, if you look through the, the the guidance that the regulators have generally put out, I, I think the term business judgments or professional judgments uh, has been used something like 10, 10, 11 times throughout the guidance. Uh, so, so that's the good news. The good news is that uh, you, you have a fair amount of latitude uh, in, in how to kind of discharge your KYP duty. Like the regulators have set out, you must do written evidence of your KYP. How you do that is going to be kind of subject to your model, subject to, to your business practices, and subject to the securities you sell. Um, the regulators have given explicit guidance that uh, all, all products are not the same. You're, in terms of assessment, uh, products that are lower risk, that are public, that are well understood, uh, the, the diligence requirement is going to be lower. Uh, and per perhaps you can even be doing it by sector. Like, for instance, uh, you may be doing uh, a KYP write-up on all the bank stocks in, in, in Canada as a sector as opposed to individually. And kind of on the other side of the scale, uh, maybe uh, proprietary private products that, that are bespoke and complicated and perhaps have der derivatives, uh, that, that diligence requirement is, is going to be much more um, intensive. And the regulators have put out a bit of a list, again, on a principles basis in the guidance. Um, and obviously, uh, there's a lot of mutual fund uh, dealers on, on this call. So uh, I, I would say that uh, kind of public mutual funds probably fall closer to the to the bank stock side of this the spectrum. But again, mileage is going to vary depending on the, the, the attributes of the product. Certainly, Richard, I, I can totally appreciate given the, the, the volume of securities and sort of different security types, it, the, just this whole process of assessment and monitoring could be significant uh, burden for many for many dealers. Um, 
let me let me sort of jump to specifically the, the question around the frequency of that assessment. Is there any insight to share on that front? Is, is it going to be is quarterly enough, semi annually? Any line to draw in the sand there? I mean, let's start with the good news. So the good news is that uh, when when the rules came out back in 2018, the requirement was ongoing monitoring, period, and stop. Uh, industry kind of pushed back, and and now the requirement is significant changes in the product. So already we have a bit of a narrowing of what your obligation is. Uh, but again, kind of going back to the theme of professional reasonable judgment, there, there really isn't any definition of what monitoring for significant change is in the guidance. Uh, the regulators have basically said that it's gonna vary from your model and it's gonna marry, vary based on your products that you sell. Uh, I mean, my, my personal litmus test for significant change is a change or event that's gonna occur that's gonna significantly affect the market price of the security, kind of going back to uh, securities material change routes, so to speak. Um, but, but I think uh, the, the question you have to be asking is what, what events are going to move the market? I mean, for, for mutual funds, uh, uh, renewal dates, uh, if, if someone's publishing a renewed prospectus, are you running black lines to see what changes happen? Are you running black lines on, on fun facts, um, uh, disclosure like that? Are you setting up Google alerts for, for earnings calls for public issuers? Um, again, th there's a lot of technology solutions where you don't have to necessarily go out into the market um, and find all these events. The, the, these events can kind of come to you on a technology basis. Uh, but I think it's important in your KYP write-up that you're putting in, in kind of that diligence spreadsheet, so to speak. These are the types of changes we're going to be looking for, whether it's uh, new, new disclosure, uh, new alerts, what have you, and, and basically follow through on those, those tags as part of the, the KYC diligence process. Um, I, I think that's a that's a slight plug for us to do a selfless uh, uh, promotion of our solutions to avoid uh, the myriad of Google alerts uh, to be set up in the in the in the year to come. Um, Trevor, any comments on sort of this notion of sh monitoring a shelf and specifically on the proprietary products front? Well, I think there's quite a difference between our proprietary products and, and uh, the third party uh, assets are being held with proprietary products. We're we're obviously we're, we're in control of, of the changes and we can communicate them out to our advisor team uh, as opposed to uh, Googling it and finding out um, that way. What's more, um, the focus for, you know, we're, we're for us this year is, is going to be the third party uh, products and, and how to have a really an efficient process. Um, not, we don't want to um, uh, over labor our advisors on this. We want to centralize this as much as possible um, so our back office is communicating to advisors so they can focus on on what is what is relevant uh, changes to them. Um, and really with with that, um, it's you know efficiency and but also flexibility because I think as we're hearing they're, they're, we've got some high level guidance, uh, you know do the do the right thing. Uh, level guidance will probably over time that's going to mature. Uh, so we would want to look for solutions that are very flexible. Um, if we, and definitely not fully automating this to start with, we need a probably a bit of a human touch to make sure that we don't uh, uh, bombard our, our, our field with, with what it turns out to be inconsequential changes, right? Whether it relates to, I think, as you're talking about price, but also uh, quality of these, these assets and, and given our advisors uh, the flexibility on how they made decisions to build those, those portfolios, uh, we'd want to be ensure that they get the right information so that you know, we're not wasting their time reviewing reviewing these things. These are getting to the heart of, of why they made those original decisions for those uh, books. Thanks, Trevor. That's very helpful. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we polled our industry roundtable about their plans for uh, monitoring significant change on their product shelf. Dave, can you, can I Flip it to you. Can you comment a little bit about uh, what we found out through this through this poll? You bet. Uh, and so when we did poll our uh, the the members of our roundtable, we observed that nearly seventy percent of dealers were exploring, uh, you know, or had questions about how how best to monitor for significant changes and assess their product shelf. And linked to that, in our own research, uh, you know, we showed that the number of changes in the fund universe is significant, you know, averaging, you know, frequently over a thousand changes per week. 
Uh, now, some of those are material and, you know, some not so much. But, uh, you know, Richard, to your point, you know, how, how do you sift through that? And, and you want to make sure you're really catching uh, the ones that make a difference. Uh, and so it's not surprising that, uh, that this is a challenge uh, for, for many, uh, many firms that are trying to figure out how to, how to do this. Um, and it's not that this information isn't available. It's just that there's so much of it. It's in different formats. It's inconsistent. The timeliness of it is, is really all over the map. Sometimes it's linked to a particular relationship you may have with, a, you know, an account manager at Mass at, uh, you know, at a fund company. But it, it, it's all uh, very uh, all over the map in, in many ways. And so that's a challenge of how to, how to master and stay on top of that data. Um, a, a year ago, we introduced our shelf monitor solution to help support our clients to, to overcome these challenges. Uh, and, and I've really been looking at, at refining and, and building off of that. Uh, I'll, I'll show a, a two minute video right now of our shelf monitor solution uh, and, and how that works and how we're looking to, uh, to help our, our, our clients and our partners uh, address this, this uh, challenge. Every night, Shelf Monitor reviews industry data to find material changes to the products on your shelf. Keeping track of changes has never been easier. For example, ETF and mutual fund terminations and additions are communicated in an inconsistent format, from press releases to material change reports at unpredictable times. With Shelf Monitor, you can find all relevant additions and deletions in a single place. Shelf Monitor tracks all the changes at the fund series level, so you know exactly what was affected. The changes are presented in a consistent format and available on demand. When there are hundreds of risk rating changes in a single month, instead of looking out for news releases from fund companies, you need a tool to easily identify which products became riskier and which decreased in risk ratings. When there are thousands of product changes like MERs to sort through, Shelf Monitor helps you easily identify the funds with the biggest changes. Our goal really is to get you the right information when you need it. While Shelf Monitor reviews many data fields and data sources on a nightly basis, you decide which data points to turn on or off. Our proprietary materiality index then lets you sift through the noise and control which changes rise to the top. You can monitor changes on your shelf using Shelf Monitor's web interface. You can also get significant change alerts sent directly to your inbox. Demonstrating compliance with your significant change monitoring obligation is only a click away. So that's a quick peek at some of the work uh, we're doing on the, on the product front. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, let's now zoom in and turn the page to uh, focusing on the individual reps obligations, where the client focus reform beyond what was historically a suitability or a matching exercise to ask the rep to understand the security she's recommending, the impact of that recommendation's fees on the client's portfolio, and let's not forget, consider a reasonable range of alternatives made available through the firm. And let's not forget that under section 11.5, the rep will need to maintain records on how she met her KYP and suitability requirements. With this backdrop, let me focus, uh, let me turn the conversation to our panelists. What's been evident with the FAQs that have been published through the CSA is that these new requirements are raising some questions in the industry. What are some practical approaches uh, in, in your view for tackling these requirements? Richard, I'll start with you. Uh, thanks. Uh, I mean, when it comes to the CFRs and compliance generally, I, I, I usually come back to my, my two golden rules, if you want to call it that. Uh, my, my first rule is effort counts. Uh, the standard for compliance is, has been and never will be absolute perfection. Uh, people who try to strive for that usually end up kind of going too far the other way. 
there, there's, there's, a, there's a range here. And um, what regulators are looking for when, I, when I'm working with clients through audits is does a firm have a culture of compliance? Um, as long as you have turned your mind to the CFRs making, and are making a concerted effort, and obviously clients are, are not in danger or kind of adversely affected by what you're doing, uh, typically you're, you're going to have a conversation with the regulator about interpretation or, or approach, but you're not falling under that dangerous red line. Uh, where you're falling under that dangerous red line, that, that, that's a whole other conversation. So again, effort does matter here. Um, and again, that's why you guys should be starting uh, kind of implementing the CFRs today. Uh, the second piece, the second golden rule is, and uh, Parma alluded to this, um, I, I think this is the regulator's motto, if, if there's any unofficial motto they have, which is if it's not documented, it does not exist. You can sit in a client opening meet, uh, audit meeting and talk about all the great things you're doing from a, from a compliance or diligence standpoint. If there's not paper supporting that, 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 that conversation, it, it's white noise to the regulator. So as you're kind of, as you're implementing the CFRs, as you're implementing your diligence process, you have to be thinking about what's the paper that backs up what I'm doing? Is there a clear paper flow from uh, point A to point Z? And, and if you're achieving that, you're, you're probably in a good spot. Thanks, Richard. That's very helpful. Greg, maybe, maybe you can share some insights from sort of a practitioner's perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, the way we've been looking at it, having advisors spend hundreds of hours doing their own research to be able to build their KYP knowledge and provide a reasonable range of alternatives uh, it would be a significant impact on them. One approach that we're looking at do using is to use a comparison tool like Peer Compare. A tool like this will allow advisors to convert those hundreds of hours of work into mere minutes. It will help them meet their KYP obligations, provide their clients with a reasonable range of alternatives, and give them the ability to make an informed recommendation. It also uh, gives the ability to uh, document the evidence that, they, that shows what their options were that they were considered. Uh, another approach that we're looking at, we're actually borrowing from the insurance side of our business where uh, most of our advisors are also licensed. On the insurance side, our advisors use a document called a reason why letter to document the recommendations that they make to their clients. We're looking at using a similar type of an approach on the mutual fund side, using a reason why type document that prompts them to easily document the specific requirements that our regulators are expecting to see with regard to suitability. That's very helpful, actually. It's a quite a unique approach that might be uh, setting up a trend in the industry. Um, let me turn it back to you, Richard. Did any of the comment letters and FAQs introduce any substantive items or do you feel that these requirements as they're sort of set up in the background on our screen here, uh, are they generally interpreted and will be implemented without any pain points going forward? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I would encourage everyone to go to the CSA website. They, they've published a relatively comprehensive uh, FAQ list. Um, and uh, if you can't find it, um, I'm sure if you email Parm, he'll, he'll, he'll happily direct you towards it. Uh, that, that's a really instructive tool. Um, in terms of the actual comment period that just ended for the IROC and MSDA rules, um, I, I think there was only about a handful of letters. Um, again, they were they were thoughtful letters, but they were short. Uh, so I, I think that uh, if you're looking for guidance on interpretation, the FAQ um, is, is definitely the first place to go. Um, and again, keep your eyes out for, for additional FAQs and additional implementation guidance as, as we go through the year. Thanks, Richard. Let me let me sort of uh, change the perspective on this a little bit and, and ask you and Greg, in, in your respective views, um, how do these requirements raise the bar for the advisor when it comes to meeting their, their new suitability requirements? Uh, Greg, you want to you want to jump in first or? Sure. Yeah, I'll take this one. Uh, I would say that they absolutely raise the bar for our advisors. They now have to have a better understanding of the thousands and thousands of products that are available to them on our product shelves. Uh, they have to consider things like risk, cost, and return for these uh, products. Uh, they must also assess how these funds are considering, that they are considering compare against other uh, peer funds that are in these, key, in these key areas. So using a comparison tool will definitely assist advisors to understand the funds that they recommend and how they stack up against their peers. It's worth noting, however, that regardless of how well a tool works in providing these comparisons to an advisor, 
the onus is still on the advisor to understand the fund they are recommending. This means that if the fund they choose based on the tools comparison is not known to them, they will still need to do a lot of research on it to ensure that it's a proper fit for their client. I mean, I, I would just add to that, that uh, I, I think that, uh, that, that, that if you if you want to kind of explain the, the client focus reforms in 10 seconds or less, and don't try because I, I hurt myself trying to do that, um, it, it's basically a codification of the best practices that staff have been pushing for the last five or 10 years uh, since the introduction of 31103. So a lot of the requirements are not necessarily net new. It's more pushing the regular, uh, the industry towards that best, uh, best practices standard. Um, but I think the pain point here is, it's not just pushing you towards the best practices. It's also that it's now requiring you to document it. Uh, dealers and advisors have been great about due diligence, uh, but when it comes to the paper and kind of proving that you're doing it for, for an audit purpose or for, for, for a litigation purpose, that that's when dealers and advisors have been falling down. And this, this, this is kind of, it, I don't want to speak for the regulators, but my interpretation of why the CFRs exist is to push uh, dealers and advisors to have that be better paper record. That's very helpful. Um, speaking of sort of this level of requirements and the elevated nature of sort of documentation that you have both talked about, I wonder, uh, in your respective views, and Richard, I'll, I'll ask you to start this response. W what are the top challenges that a firm will need to consider with respect to this notion of considering a reasonable range of alternatives? So I, I think that's probably been the main topic of conversation between industry and, and the regulators for the last two years. Um, there, there's been a real uh, concern that if, if you're not only dil diligencing your product, but three or four products adjacent to that product, uh, you're, you're exponentially increasing the diligence requirements. Um, and, and I think that might have the unintended consequence of narrowing product shelves, maybe. We'll, we'll have to see how that plays out over the course of the next couple of years. Um, but, but I think it's important when you think of reasonable range of alternatives, uh, the, the challenge is figuring out what that means. And again, to sound like the broken record, I, I promised you I would. Uh, the, the implementation guidance is going to be important here. Um, I will note that the, the range of alternative language is drawn from the suitability requirement, not the KYP requirement, but, but it does come up in the KYP diligence piece or obligation a number of times. And I, I think it's important to think of the why. Why, why does, uh, uh, when, when, when should you be considering a reasonable range of alternatives? Um, and kind of my initial kind of review of the, 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 the rules as they stand. And again, big, my, my lawyer caveat that, that all this is subject to change as, as we get more guidance. But, but I think the, the reasonable range of alternatives uh, is meant to address a, a main uh, conflict of interest pain point that regulators have been discussing for, for a number of years. Um, as, as dealers, um, there, there's been a perception that when you're selling a security or when you're recommending a security to a client, uh, that client is thinking, oh, this person's getting paid for that, uh, uh, for that recommendation. They don't really think this is the best product. Uh, so the extent, to the extent you are getting paid uh, or you're getting some kind of compensation for a recommendation, uh, doing that uh, comparator review or market comparator review um, actually serves as protection for you um, because you're, you're basically able to look at your product, compare it against similar products and, and take the compensation question out of the picture. So yes, it's a regulatory rule, but it also serves as a benefit for you on, on a civil protection standpoint as well. Um, and the second why is, um, you, especially if, you, if you're a dealer in, in, a, in a large shop or, or, or well, even a medium-sized shop, uh, there, there has been a number of commission, uh, let's say decisions or, or conversations over, over the last couple of years about whether there's an expectation for, uh, let's call it dealer A, uh, to know all the products um, on, on a firm shelf or just the products that dealer A is shell, um, selling. Um, and I, I think the regulators have always been concerned that when a client walks up to the dealer, sh the dealer shop, that any given dealer in that shop will know, have a general understanding of all the products that are on the shelf. So this basically codifies um, obligations to address that expectation that when a dealer is recommending product one, two, three, four, and five, 
they also know products 10, 11, 12 that, that are also available at their shop, at least at a general level. Thank you, Richard. Greg, any, any insights from a practitioner's perspective? Yes, but to kind of echo what uh, Richard was saying, I think one of the biggest things that we need to consider is what exactly a reasonable range of alternatives is, uh, especially for advisors who don't use a technology solution uh, or don't have one at their fingertips. Uh, how many fund companies, how many funds do they need to consider when they're making their recommendation to their client? Uh, as Richard mentioned, there's lots of mention of the words professional judgment as to determine how many funds you need to compare to. And so uh, you have to figure that out. You have to use your professional judgment and then you have to document why you chose the ones that you did. This is one of the main reasons that Quadris is looking for a technology solution as it'll take a lot of that guesswork out of determining how many funds to compare. Uh, another consideration that we're looking at is do we make something like a technology solution mandatory for the entire field force? Uh, we have advisors that have a really deep knowledge of our entire product shelf. And as such, like, do we force them to use a, a tool like this if it's something that they already know? So right now, as it stands, we're not expecting to make technology a mandatory solution for everybody. But uh, for those who decide not to use a technology solution, they'll still have the responsibility to document the options considered and why they went with the recommendation that they did. Thanks, Greg. Both you and Richard just really shed some interesting light on this particular requirement that's raised some questions. Dave, uh, let me turn it over to you. Uh, can you comment on the results of our industry poll on this particular topic as it relates to the advisor's new obligations? Yeah, and, and again, not surprisingly, uh, this is proving to be one of the bigger challenges of the CF, uh, you know, of implementing the CFRs. Um, and, and Greg and, and Richard really touched on a few of those key ones. You know, given the principles-based nature uh, of the client folks to reform, there's a high degree of ambiguity uh, around the practical application and obligations uh, of, of the advisors. And so when we polled, uh, those who attended our roundtable, nearly 75% uh, really identified the, the KYP and the assessment of, of alternatives as, uh, as, as a major concern and uh, challenge for them. Uh, to, to meet these obligations, advisors are required, as, as Greg said, to, to really demonstrate a mastery a proficiency of a boatload of data uh, in order to consider alternatives, to know what alternatives are, uh, and it ultimately, Richard, to your point, to make suitable recommendations. Uh, and then that final step, which while that may be a best practice that's now codified, uh, the final step of being able to demonstrate uh, that advisors are consistently following this process potentially adds a significant administrative burden to, to advisors uh, that, that you're always trying to avoid. Um, our peer compare solution uh, is designed, it, you know, our focus was really to streamline that process uh, so that advisors can, can meet the obligation uh, in a consistent way every time and connecting consideration of alternatives right through to automating some of the record keeping portion uh, to not make this uh, overly burdensome. And uh, similar to the shelf monitor, I've got a two minute video here that I'll play that show that gives you a quick overview of uh, how Peer Compare is set up to, uh, to help advisors meet this requirement. An advisor can confidently meet this regulatory challenge by using Investor Comp's Peer Compare. Peer Compare creates a frictionless experience that empowers the advisor to go beyond the matching exercise and assess how a recommendation stacks up against reasonable range of alternatives based on a configurable peer group and comparison dimensions. So how does an advisor use Peer Compare? Let's join our advisor just after she's determined that a real estate fund recommendation is aligned with the client's needs and circumstances. At this point, she can check off the requirement that her recommendation is aligned with the client's KYC document. Now she needs to assess how the key aspects of her recommendation, namely cost, risk, and return, stacks up against available alternatives. Instead of sifting through a myriad of regulatory documents or conducting a side-by-side -side comparison, Peer Compare generates a peer group which is a subset of similar products available on her shelf. In our real estate fund example, if the advisor's recommended fund 
doesn't stack up well to its peers, she can change her selection to an alternative real estate fund that stacks up better among other suitable options. Peer Compare completes the advisor's workflow by integrating with the record keeping engine. The advisor's recommendation, analysis of available alternatives, and accompanying advisor notes are tracked all centrally in our application. The solution also delivers and tracks all related disclosure documents to your investor. And all activities can be reported and tracked at the advisor, branch, or enterprise. And so that gives you a bit of a sense of how the, the power, what we call, think of as the power of the peer group and the relative comparison really, really hones in on that, uh, the consideration of alternatives to make, to streamline that through to the record keeping aspect. And uh, Parham with that, I'm going to shift, uh, you know, we're, we've kind of reached the time of content and uh, I've got notice from, uh, from Karen that we do have a number of questions. So I think we'll, we'll transition to that piece. And uh, before we do, so just a reminder, uh, use the chat feature within the Zoom window. And as you're typing those, and Parham is gearing up to ask our panelists some questions, I'll just remind you uh, a couple of things. There's a number of requests of whether a recording uh, will be made available. And so a replay uh, will be available uh, in your inbox uh, this week, uh, as Karen will send out reminders in addition to other resources uh, that there have been some questions about. So, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, uh, on the screen here, you can see some, some highlights uh, that we've published from our prior two uh, roundtable events as well. And with that, Parm, uh, I'll let you start fielding some questions. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Dave. We've got a ton of questions to get through. So uh, to our panelists, get ready. Uh, Richard, I'll start with you. Um, is there any guidance on how firms with proprietary product shelves can assess the competitive nature of their shelves? And how frequently would they be able to do this? As, would they need to do this assessment? Yeah, so I, I think um, the, the guidance right now is that, uh, I'll, I'll, again, broken record time, uh, professional judgment is key. Uh, we know that uh, kind of third party proprietary products are probably on the the more detailed uh, range of the scale in terms of the diligence requirements. Um, but, but I would just say, and I know I've been deferring to the concept of professional judgment a, a, a few times today, um, what that means, um, and I, I just wanted to make a point of saying that, what, what that means is gonna be developed by industry. So um, we're, we're all sitting in this webinar learning about what our, what our competitors are doing, what our colleagues are doing, um, professional judgment effectively means that if, if you ask nine of your peers, what are they doing? Um, and they say they're doing a seven out of 10, then you probably should be doing a seven out of 10 as well. So that's why these, these, these conferences, these webinars, especially over the course of this year and, and for the coming years are, are going to be that important because it's, it's industry that's going to set the standard for what professional judgment is. Thank you, Richard. Dave, do you, do you have a response on, on how uh, we can help on that particular front on the, on the assessment of, of the uh, proprietary shelf? Yeah, just a, a quick one there. As we've uh, thought through, you know, really bringing what we get in shelf monitor, uh, monitoring change and then peer compare it relative assessment, we're starting to work with clients to, to really assess the health of their shelf. Uh, so that's really through a fund analysis reporting capability to just understand how which products are competitive, which ones are not, uh, and which ones may have more conflict in them. Thanks, Dave. Okay, some of these questions are a bit meaty, so I'll open it to the floor. Um, on the KYP side, are firms anticipating a reduction of the products on their shelves? Anybody Is anyone considering moving to a proprietary shelf only model? Jeopardy question, background music going on. Richard, any, any insights on that front? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say that, again, we, we, we've been having this conversation with the regulators for the last two years. A number of people have put in comment letters about the client-focused reforms. This has been one of the main concerns uh, from industry in terms of the, the unintended consequences of, of the KYP requirement or the CFRs generally. Uh, again, we're, we're gonna have to see if that plays out. Um, but uh, again, I, I think the, the, the kind of takeaway I would give for firms is uh, make sure you're complying with, whenever you're recommending a product, the question is, have, in recommending that product, do you have documented proof that you've done the KYP? 
And if it gets unwieldy, then yeah, you're going to have to take a look at what's feasible and what's not feasible. Um, but th at the end of the day, uh, this, this is kind of the, 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 the new world we're in, so to speak. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Uh, a little bit more specific question. Maybe this is one's for you, Greg. We use a reason why letter in our insurance practice as it makes uh, for a great review tool uh, just before you put in a plan into place. Would this be a reasonable requirement for uh, on the mutual fund side? Well, we're looking at having a, a reason why type document on the mutual fund side, basically because while there's some advisors out there who are really good at documenting their conversations with their clients, there's many advisors where that is one of the biggest uh, things that they struggle with. And so we're looking at creating a reason why type template that uh, it specifies, uh, it gives them really pointed direction. This is what you need to document uh, and, and possibly drop down lists, something that at least they have an understanding that they, this is what I need to document and they have it uh, kept for it. And then uh, depending on how it's stored, it may be available to compliance oversight so they can look at it if they're doing a review of a trade and say, hmm, does this work for the client? Can I, I want to look at the reason why letters say, okay, yes, that does make sense for this client. So it, it adds a lot of uh, uh, documentation, a lot of uh, meat behind the, the sale. And also in our industry where all of our advisors are insurance-based, it makes things a lot more uh, consistent across their product or, or their sales process. If they're doing a reason why on the insurance side, doing it on the mutual fund side makes it just a consistent practice. Thanks, Greg. Hey, Parham, I'm just going to break in here for a second. Uh, so we had promoted the event to end at 11.45. Uh, there are a lot of unasked questions. I'm going to give you permission to go another five minutes because I know the questions are fast and furious. Uh, in the meantime, I just put the slide up here because we will end up cutting off before having dealt with them all. And uh, as I mentioned, post event, Karen will send out uh, information, some resources, how to reach us. Uh, here is on the screen how to reach us if you need to uh, contact us after the event. And uh, without further ado, Parham, keep the questions going. <laughs> Right back at you. We've got a, I got a question lined up for you, Dave. Um, how does InvestorCom determine the peer group in quotations? Yeah, so I mean, technically InvestorCom doesn't. Uh, each dealer can decide what that is. Having said that, there are some standard uh, buckets depending on the product type, obviously. Um, you know, in the mutual fund example that, that we showed on the, uh, on the video, there was a, an asset uh, category, risk, rating, time horizon, and share class or fund series uh, commission type. Uh, so that's, that's the way that was done. But based on the data, we've got there a number that any firm can choose to have that like or apples to apples comparison. Thanks, Dave. Okay, a little bit of a philosophical question, Richard. I'll, I'll ask you to respond to this one. Does KYP apply to each individual security? In other words, do we need to do an analysis for every recommendation? So I'm 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 going to be the 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 lawyer here and and say it, it's going to depend. Um, uh, bottom line is we have guidance from the regulators that you, for every security you don't need a, a separate sheet of paper saying this is my write up on this specific security. It's going to depend on the type of security. So again, going back to the example we talked about earlier, you may be able to do a single sheet write up on all the the, the sector for bank stocks covering maybe 10, 15, 20 securities. Again, you can kind of amalgamate uh, the KYC process where the product's public, where it's low risk, where it's simple. Uh, as you get kind of more into the complex, private, uh, bespoke, derivative, proprietary, all those kind of tags that, that the regulators have used in the guidance, yeah, you're probably starting to get into, you're, you're looking at uh, uh, specific diligence for that product. And as, as it gets more complicated, more detailed. So it, it, the best way to think of it is almost at, like a spectrum uh, from, from one extreme to the other and consider your product shelf and where does it fall within that spectrum. Thanks, Richard. Dave, I'll, I'll ask you one more question. I know we're short on time, so but I think there's a couple of questions related to how fast we can onboard. So uh, there's a question that says, hello, what would be the expected timeline to implement shelf monitor system for a dealer? Yeah, so it's without a whole lot of configurations, that's a four to six week turn on or activation. Um, the, the, it's really around 
once we know what the what your shelf is, it turns on. Uh, and then some of those configurations are what are the comparison attributes we want to look at, what are the different product types, and how do you configure peer groups. But it's uh, it's relatively seamless because it doesn't require personal information. It's just how do we filter on your shelf? Uh, that's the key data point. Dave, do we do we uh, continue or do we do we? Uh... I'll give you one last question before. Excellent. Our time comes out. Okay. All right. Um, this one is probably a little bit more specific to bank dealers, but let me give it a shot. Uh, what have you uh, folks heard generally about major banks and uh, and financial institutions and how they're assessing the requirement around reasonable range of alternatives? Uh, have you heard any insights on any processes or solutions being implemented to date? Any comments? I, I mean, I would just kind of briefly say, uh, I, I, I can't talk obviously about specific clients, um, but, but I would say that I, I wouldn't be overly fussed about what banks are necessarily doing. Again, going back to me being the broken record, professional judgment, what, what banks are doing might not necessarily be what you have to do, depending on the size of your shop and, and the types of products you're offering. Um, so trying to do a, a one size fits all, um, might not be the best approach and might be overkill for your business. So a, in terms of what banks are doing, um, th they all have kind of their own internal proprietary processes. Um, but uh, I, I would just leave it with uh, try to find shops that are similar to you and see what they're doing. I think that's probably the more important comparator group. It's a business school comment. Benchmark to your peers. <laughs> Um, one more quick question. Maybe this is, again, a little bit philosophical, but uh, bear with me. Uh, okay, Richard, as with any regulatory requirements, the term reasonable is used quite often. What are reasonable expectations when making, uh, when, when talking about the KYP obligations? Yeah, I mean, reasonable is basically an, another way to say professional judgment. Uh, I, I, I would say that, um, as I kind of alluded to before, um, what we're at the 20 we're at the 80 yard line so we have 20 yards left to go to the gold line uh we, we have the rules they're baked how they're implemented and how they're interpreted by industry is going to take the better part of the next year and probably beyond uh, uh webinars like this one provided by investorcom uh tools um conferences it's really important that you're you're staying on top of that and trying to figure out what your comparator group is doing you don't want to fall below that line you don't necessarily want to be above that line yet also because you might be doing too much you you really want to find that sweet spot of this this is typically what's reasonable because i know that most of my uh peers are doing it and again as as audits kind of start going out on the cfrs uh this this is going to change again because staff is going to have a conversation with with each firm as part of the audit process and uh it, it this just just like 31 103 was in 2009 uh, this is going to be an ongoing conversation for a number of years um, and you're going to have to monitor as, as that line shifts one way or the other. Thanks, Richard. I think we can squeeze in one more question just to be uh, flexible here, just to answer folks' questions. And they just keep coming in. Um, do you have to go beyond material changes that issuers uh, publicize uh, when, required, when monitoring significant changes? Very specific. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in just because I love talking about this kind of stuff. Um, I, I think it's important to remember that the, the, the legal term that you as uh, registrants are subject to is not material change. It's, it's significant change. Uh, I'm, I'm using material change because it, it's a well understood term in the industry and, and issuers are well familiar with it. Um, but again, uh, you're going to want to look to what your peers are doing. Um, in, in terms of what flags they're, they're getting. I, I think at minimum, you wanna be looking at changes in disclosure documents, any news releases, any material change reports. Uh, but, but going beyond that is, is gonna depend on the nature of your shop and the nature of the product. I, I will say that uh, you, you wanna be probably looking at uh, uh, products more closely when they're higher risk products or more complex products. And again, um, there, there's, there's considerations beyond the product itself. Uh, if, if there's a sector downturn or if there's a market downturn, uh, those businesses are going to be under stress. By definition, there will be significant changes 
um, and you're going to want to monitor that as, monitor that as well. Very well put, Richard. Thank you. Dave, I'll pass it over to you. I know I've gone over time. Uh, in, uh, to, to, to quote Richard, in my professional judgment, I think it's time to wrap up. Um, and, and thank our, our, uh, our panelists and our attendees. Uh, Greg, Trevor, and Richard, thank you so much for, uh, for your time and contributions today. Based on the amount of activity and the attendance today, uh, this is the time to talk about this, and there's a lot of interest. And uh, certainly, as I've mentioned, the third in our series, uh, the amount of discussion increases every time. Uh, and I think this is the, the first time we've had this volume of conversation. So the conversation continues. Um, we will provide for sure some event follow-up materials, as I've said, and, uh, and as we look at uh, continuing this dialogue over the course of the year, um, you know, getting more specific, getting more detailed, looking at rollout plans, uh, as everyone is getting more specific uh, at meeting these obligations, uh, the conversation will continue. So thank you, thanks again for your participation uh, and attendance today, and uh, I look forward to keeping the conversation going. And as you've seen, the, the email addresses on the screen here, Richard Pritcher is our client director. Uh, feel free to reach out to him and he can coordinate uh, from demos to getting questions answered. Uh, he loves to talk to uh, anyone who comes his way. So thank you again and have a good day. Thank you.